Welcome back to the channel everyone. As you may or may not be able to tell, I'm at a cooperage. I'm at Speyside Cooperage up in Speyside. And in this video, we're gonna look at the history of sherry casks. Welcome back to the channel everyone and this is a video that I've been wanting to make for a long time and a big thanks to Space Eye Cooperage for hosting me here today and a big thanks to Ronnie who sat off camera making sure that I don't go climbing that pyramid of casks. Now the reason for making this video is to basically try and debunk some of the myths about sherry casks because there's a big difference between your perception of what a sherry cask is and the reality of it is. Now when you mature whiskey in a cask you tend to think of it being like an ex-bourbon cask or an ex-sherry cask or an ex-wine cask. But the big, the big misleading one there are the ex-sherry casks. So ex-bourbon casks have been used to mature bourbon in. Ex-wine casks have been used to mature wine in. But sherry casks have never really been used to mature sherry. And to understand that, first of all, we have to understand how sherry is made and why that's the case. So what is sherry then? Sherry is a fortified wine made in a small region of Spain. Uh, it's in a triangle between Jerez de la Frontera, El Puerta de Santa Maria, and uh, San Clair du Baramida. Again, I am not Spanish. That is not how you pronounce those names, but we'll probably put them on the screens for you. But sherry is made from a process of crushing, fermenting, and maturing grapes. And the way that sherry is matured, it's matured in what's known as a solera system. And a solera, the word itself means literally on the ground. So a solera system is normally a row of three barrels or a tier of three barrels. So one, two, three tiers high. So when the rind's ready to go in the cask, it goes into the solera system. And the way that a solera system works, it's never empty. A solera system is permanently full. If when you're getting the mature sherry out of the cask, you go to the bottom cask and you take no more than a third of the liquid out of that cask. You then go to the second tier and fill up that bottom tier with the liquid that you've withdrawn. Then you go to the top tier, fill up that second tier, and then you go to the top tier and fill that in with your new wine. Therefore, a sherry solera system is never empty. There are never any ex sherry casks from a solera system. And in fact, some cooperages or some soleras uh, and sherry producers have got casks that are over 200 years old and they're prized for their inert, you know, their inert nature rather than sort of being a very active wood like we see in whiskey maturation. Now, as far as I'm aware, there's been very few whiskies matured in solera casks. The Talisker Bodega series is the only one that I know of. And well, if that's the case, and if we never really mature sherry in a sherry cask, then why do we get the term sherried whiskey or why do we call sherried casks sherried casks? In order to understand how we get to today and the sherry casks of today, we have to go back in time to the 19th century. And, you know, the origins of whiskey and wood and casks were originally a storage vessel. They were nothing more than sort of like a, a, the carrier bag or IBC of their day. It was used for moving goods from one place to another. And it's as simple as that, really. Customers would go, would take their bottles and their stoneware crocks over to the grocers and there would be a cask behind the grocers, you, you know, uh, worktop and they would fill the whiskey directly there. And the same with sherry. The customers would go to the grocers, they would take their bottles and it would be filled directly from the cask into the bottles that were provided. And you've got to remember most of this was done into stoneware crocks until about 1845 or the middle of the 19th century because glass was so heavily taxed. Now, no one really knows when wooden casks were first used to mature whiskey, and it was probably more of an evolution than an introduction. Now, it's important to remember that whiskey production used to be seasonal. Whiskey production historically took place in the autumn and winter months when the barley harvest was ready, the water was very cold, which aided the, 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 the condensation of the, of the vapors, and the whiskey needed to be stored before it could be sold at market. Likewise, it needed to be moved from the distillery over to the grocers and wooden casks were plentiful. And this is where we start to see the use of sherry casks in the 19th century for the use with whiskey. So 
So the Scotch being the Scots would want to find a cheap and affordable way to store their whiskey and move their whiskey. And that's when they started really using sherry casks. Now, you've got to remember in the 19th century that sherry was one of the most popular drinks available. And in 1871, there were 27 million liters of sherry consumed in the UK. Now, how did that sherry get from the Triangle in Jerez in Spain over to the UK? Well, it was shipped in sherry butts or transport butts. Now, the sherry would be produced at the, at the, the wineries over in, in, in Spain, and then it would be filled into transport casks. Now, these were 500 litre butts typically. The, whisk, the, the sherry was then exported. It typically entered via Leith in Bristol. So if you imagine it was at sea for a good few weeks and in the summer it would be quite hot. So a lot of that fresh, really good sherry was being absorbed into those casks. Now, it's important to note that these transport casks were European oak and not American oak like the Solera casks were. And once that sherry entered the UK in the butts, it was bottled, often at grocers. And just to give you a scale of this, in 1873, there were about 68,500 butts imported. And obviously it wasn't economical to ship these butts back to Spain empty. Enter the Scots thinking, this is a cheap storage vessel, let's put our whiskey into it, it seems perfect for it. Now at the end of the 20th century, there was a rising demand for sherry casks for the use of storing and maturing whiskey, but there was a growing decline in the casks because sherry was decreasing in popularity. So the, the whiskey producers had to be innovative and figure out ways to meet the demand for sherry casks. So those casks that we've just talked about, I'll refer to now as the transport casks. So with the transport casks of the 19th century, as the 20th century went on, they didn't use poor, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sherry butts that often. They moved more to sort of more uh, convenient bulk containers rather than wooden casks. But at the early part of the 20th century, attempts were made by a Glaswegian called William Lowry, who was a blender and sherry agent. And he also was a merchant for Port Ellen and Gonzalez Sherries. And he was apparently the man who we owe the first sort of replication of these transport casks. So what Lowry did, he took a volume of sherry, about 20 to 30 litres, and he put it into an empty cask. And then he used steam pressure to impregnate that sherry into the wood. And there's a quote that says sort of like in 1929, that all of the casks that were used for Johnny Walker were treated with 35 litres of sherry for about six weeks before they were used to mature the whiskey. So the third type of sherry casks were a way to try and replicate those casks that were seasoned but in a perhaps more economical manner and this is when we introduced Paxaret or Pax. Now Pax is like a very sweet concentrated sweet wine. It's made of the Pedro Ximenez grapes and it was fortified with must and lots of sugars and then reduced down so it was like an ultra concentrated sort of syrup. Now, a lot of the Macallan casks that, you know, a lot of the Macallan whiskies, the Dalmore whiskies, the big sherry bombs that we know today from the mid part of the 20th century were probably matured in casks that were Pax treated. And Ronnie said here, like when he was a cooper, you would put a big dollop of Pax into each cask when it needed a bit of a, a you know, a rejuvenation. And Pax, it was really used for sort of like the refreshing of casks until around 1990 when the Scotch Whiskey Association decided to ban the practice. I've not really found the exact reasons why it was banned, but I believe it was because it was more seen as a additive rather than being a full term maturation. So if you look at Bourbon, that's a full cask of whiskey, a full cask of American whiskey stored in, in, in that vessel. You then go to Pax and that was just a few dollops of this ultra concentrated solution put into the cask and steam treated to go in. So it was probably because it was deemed more of an additive rather than a full, a full term maturation that the SWA decided to ban it. And another thing that happened around 1990 was at the end of the 1980s in 1986, the Spanish government decreed that all sherry had to be bottled in Spain. So this led to a complete ban or complete you know a, a complete ban on any sherry being exported in bulk which obviously removed the need for sherry butts so now we get to the modern sherry casks of today and these are another step removed from those original transport casks that were originally you know the the, the origins of sherry casks now transport casks 
were, were fine. They treated, they, they, they held a very high quality sherry that would have been consumed by the public, which is the exact opposite of the modern sherry casks. Now, the way that the whiskey industry sources its sherry casks now is by working specifically with a cooperage over in Spain and a wine producer over in Spain. The casks are made to the exact specifications of the distillery, including the level of char and toasting, the size, and they also work with the wineries to decide on the type of wine which goes in there, like Pedro Zimenez or Oloroso, and it then goes into the cask for a period of time and it is seasoning the cask. So it's not held in there, you know, this wine isn't in there for maturation purpose, purposes, you know, for, to further enhance the wine, it's there simply to impregnate the cask. Now, those casks are, you know, seasoned for anywhere between six months and two and a half years, depending on how much sherry influence is desired by the person who's ordered them. Now, it's important to note that these are specifically engineered for the maturation of whiskey. That wine, once it's finished in that cask, it isn't suitable for human con consumption typically. It often goes into the production of sherry vinegar and sherry brandy, and handily enough, these are often on, on site at the cooperages and wineries where these casks are seasoned. So there we have it, it's the history of sherry casks from their origins in the 19th century as transport casks to the early 20th century first ever reproduction of those transport casks to casks that were treated with packs to the modern sherry casks of today which are essentially seasoned to order specifically for the whiskey industry. Now, is there anything wrong with this? Of course there's not. It makes fantastic tasting whiskey. Abela Arabuna, you know, Glen Farkless, Glendronach make absolutely sensational tasting whiskies. You can't deny that. But to say that a sherry cask is the same as a bourbon cask or a wine cask is completely different. And I think that use of the term is what I feel is a bit misleading. It, it's important to know the origins of these things because the industry paints this picture of, of how it wants to be seen. So for instance, although the SWA has banned the use of packs and other additives to casks, it's not tightened up the definition of what a sherry maturation period is. So if you hold a bourbon cask for 18 years and 24 days and put it into a sherry cask for a few days, I believe you can call that a sherry matured whiskey, which is in my mind, part of the law that is open to abuse potentially, does it really matter if, it make, if it's making the whiskey taste really nice? Not at all. Does it matter when people are putting sherry on the whiskey, on the cask, you know, on, on the bottle to try and push the price up? That's when I think there's a bit more of a problem. So once again, a big thank you to Speyside Cooperage for having me here. A big thank you to Ronnie who's sat looking at very cold over there. And I hope this video quality is okay and it's not been too shaky because it is incredibly windy up here today in Speyside. We're sort of nestled in this fantastic yard of barrels and casks and butts and hogsheads. And if you're ever in Speyside, make sure you book a visit here because it really is a fascinating visitor attraction.